welcome to the Center at Camden County College, where we share the world with you. Uh, we, I was waiting a few minutes because I know that tonight is unusual because we're now starting at 6.30, and I'm sure some of our friends probably didn't remember that. But nonetheless, um, all of our programs now will be at 6.30. We think that's probably more convenient for people, and uh, so that'll be the pattern. Now, I'm Jack Pesda. For those who don't know me, I'm director of the center. And um, uh, one of the things that's very important for us is that as you came in, you received an audience survey form. It's most important that you complete that and drop it off the table with one of our volunteers when you leave the auditorium. Um, this program, this whole series, is made possible by a uh, 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 grant from the Dietrich Botsteiber Foundation. Mr. Botsteiber, who is now deceased, when we first started doing this, was alive. He's an Austrian, came to the United States, and he made a fortune in electronics uh, related to defense. And uh, he uh, endowed this foundation, and over the years, we've, uh, we've done a number of, uh, number of projects with them. But in any case, uh, please turn off your cell phones. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to mention some uh, future events at the center. The opening event in the Middle East series called New Perspectives is at 6.30, March 13th, in this room. And our series on the Middle East, or some of our programs, are very different from what we've done in the past. In Between is actually a theatrical production, a one-person theatrical production here. Now, uh, Between refers to the fact that the person doing it is the son of a Palestinian Muslim and the son also of an Israeli Jewish woman. And so he's going to talk about what that all means and how it is growing up in that kind of household, which you could imagine would be most interesting. So that's different, and we're going to do some other things that uh, you don't normally, uh, we don't normally have in our Middle East uh, lecture series. Autism, first lecture in the autism series is uh, March 4th. Major, major concern in the United States and throughout the world. And we're only in the last 25 years or so have begun to understand uh, people who are on the uh, autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, so anyway, uh, tonight. You know, uh, we know that people have a, an abiding interest in film. I don't know about you, but I grew up uh, uh, really glued to films, whether in theaters or on television. And uh, I can honestly say that, that films helped to shape my life, certainly my interest in history. And so I see film as so powerful, and uh, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. But uh, uh, so we're very pleased we're able to bring this series on film. And one thing that uh, I don't think most people are aware of, how so many of the directors and producers were, in fact, either native-born Austrians are people of Austrian descent. And uh, as you come to these lectures, you'll hear, them, you'll hear people talking about their films, uh, which are, you know, kind of um, some of the best films ever made in America. And tonight's speaker, Joseph Mosier, uh, received his bachelor's degree from Hiram College, an MA from Ohio State University, and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. He's an assistant professor of German at Westchester University, He's published a book, I, rather he's the uh, rev book review editor for the Journal of Austrian Studies. He's uh, published a book, 2001, Most Useful German Words, as well as a number of scholarly articles in both English and German dealing with Austria and Germany. Please welcome uh, Robert Mosier to Camden County College. Well, thank you for this uh, introduction. Uh, so I have the pleasure today to talk to you about Vienna, which uh, is the city where I grew up, although I've been in this country for a quarter century. So, uh, but yeah, uh, what is this fascination with Vienna? I have for you today uh, three films uh, that we will um, be talking about. Uh, the first one is The Third Man from 1949, which is a film noir that uh, is very well known. The second film that we will get to is The Living Daylights, which is part of the James Bond 
film series, and then finally we will get to Before Sunrise, which is a romantic comedy from the 1990s that's also very popular. What all these three films have in common is you can watch them just because of Vienna. In fact, the plot can go to the sidelines, and, and that may be what we will do today. Uh, before we get to the films, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about Vienna, what kind of a place is it, what is its history. Uh, I said fascination. Fascination means both beautiful and terrible, so that's what we're going to do. Um, I'd like to be a little provocative and call Vienna the capital of Central Europe. That's why it's so uh, important. When you think about Central Europe, what other cities are there that are as important? It was the capital of um, Austria-Hungary. And what you see there on the slide in these many different colors is the entire Austro-Hungarian Empire as it was before World War I. And these different colors represent the countries into which it split it off uh, over the course of history. But when you see how large this country was, and Vienna was its capital, you, you suddenly realize, OK, this really was a very important place uh, once. And in fact, you may not realize this, the largest country in Europe that you know is Russia. But before World War I, by land mass, the second largest country was Austria-Hungary. So that's the kind of capital we're talking about, uh, a large European empire without overseas colonies. So that's the big difference to, let's say, London and um, Paris, a much older city than Berlin. Berlin really doesn't become important until Germany is founded in 1871. Um, but it is, although it's an old city, um, what you see when you go to Vienna today is not an old city, but a 19th century reconstruction of a city, much like Paris. So let me talk a little bit about what you see in Vienna. Vienna was totally rebuilt in the mid 19th century. Because what you see here is the medieval, well, blueprint, uh, city wall. Uh, the emperor, basically, Franz Josef, when he became emperor in 1848, his big project was Vienna needs to expand. The walls have to go. The medieval city was dysfunctional. There wasn't enough room. The buildings were too small. Uh, infrastructure was terrible. So basically, the city wall that you see here on very early uh, photos um, was completely demolished, except for a small part that I will show you. And the city was rebuilt in a very grand manner. And that, of course, makes for a grand capital. Uh, in many respects, when I visit Washington, D.C., it reminds me of Vienna, because Washington, D.C. was also built from scratch as a grand city modeled on Paris. And Paris itself was also rebuilt um, in the 19th century. So what you see over here, this one picture, that's all that's left of the city wall. And it's something you won't find unless you actually look for it um, in Vienna. And then below, you see a picture from the turn of the 20th century where the city wall is gone and you have the grand buildings. You see here the parliament and, and the theater. And the city wall was replaced with the Ringstrasse, the Ring Street. Uh, so whereas Paris has this very large boulevard, the Champs-Élysées, that you may have heard of or seen even, um, Vienna opted for the same thing, just in circular form. So you have this grand boulevard with trees. It's very similar, just different shape. Um, so a little bit of German. Um, we call this period the Gründerzeit. Gründerzeit in English means the founder's period. So the emperor gets rid of the wall, so now it's time to found the city, uh, and it's done fairly conservatively at the time. So the architecture that you see is, is neoclassical, it's uh, uh, neo-Gothic. Uh, so let me show you some examples. Here on the left, you see a neoclassical building. That's the Parliament of Austria. It was, once was the Parliament of Austria-Hungary, uh, which had just become a constitutional monarchy in 1867, so a little bit later, much later than England, actually. Then what you see in the center is the city hall of Vienna, which is actually bigger than the parliament. Uh, the city hall was built in neo-Gothic style because it was supposed to be um, a very German nationalist, unfortunately, enterprise. The parliament was neo-Grecian because Greek, uh, Greece was associated with democracy at the time. And then below here, you see the Burgtheater, which is actually the most important German language theater, which is not in Germany, but it's in Austria. 
So uh, that's very important to note. All of these three buildings are on the Ringstrasse and are very often featured in films that deal with Vienna because that's where people want to go um, to be seen. So, uh, but that's not the only thing that Vienna is known for. Vienna has amazing architecture. This is the more conservative kind of, uh, the, the planned architecture. Um, there's also Art Nouveau, and we'll get to that in just um, a second. So then, here you see on my slide, uh, Art Nouveau, which in German we call Jugendstil. This is something that the emperor, who by the turn of the 20th century was getting old, didn't like that much. There was a younger generation that, that created this modern architecture. Uh, but despite some of the economic crises in the late 19th century, it's something that was also created. And you see here some very beautiful examples of uh, Art Nouveau. Uh, you see here Karlsplatz, that's a, a subway station. Uh, it's very similar to the, the, the decorative subway stations you have at the Metro in Paris. Uh, then here, very famously, you see the main uh, postal savings bank. It's very different from some of these classical buildings and neo-Gothic buildings. It's a very modern building, but also very elaborate. Then you see the, the church at Steinhof. And, uh, of course, it was not only, not only was there new architecture, but the rivers were regulated. And, and you see here a gate for the, the Danube Canal that was created. And the Danube, interestingly enough, that is associated with Vienna, think about Johann Strauss and the Blue Danube, actually doesn't go through the center of Vienna. It was regulated, it goes through the outskirts at the time, and only the Danube Canal goes through um, Vienna. So lots of changes that happen. So the city we see in film on Vienna isn't, it's not a medieval city. This isn't something you know, that you might find in, in Italy. Uh, it's, it's, it's a new city. Um, okay. So then let me talk a little bit about um, the 20th century. Uh, because before we get to The Third Man, which is a film that plays right at, after World War II, uh, Vienna and Austria went through a lot of trouble. So certainly one of the biggest issues was that uh, Vienna was annexed by the Nazis in 1938. And it, it was an annexation, but unfortunately one that the large majority of Austrians welcomed, unless they were Jewish. Um, and Austria, at, after it collapsed as a monarchy in 1918, had a brief democratic period, much like Germany, but by 1934 became fascist, at that point modeled on Italian fascism because Mussolini wanted Austria as a buffer to Nazi Germany. That was good for the Jews because they weren't persecuted yet, but then in 1938 this comes to um, Austria. And so Vienna is also a place where uh, the Holocaust played, uh, unfortunately, a very big role because Austria, which has a tenth of the population of Germany, had as many Jews as Germany did. So when they fell under Nazi control, this was a tremendous tragedy um, as well. Uh, the Jews in Austria-Hungary uh, had a lot of, uh, um, well, benefits in the 19th century when they got equal rights. You mustn't forget that Austria-Hungary went very, very far into Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, was not as good a place, so there was a lot of movement out of Russia into Austria-Hungary. Uh, and at the same time, of course, so then there's German nationalism in Austria, which causes all kinds of problems. And, and so this is something that has shaped the identity of Austria and Vienna um, to this um, day. Uh, here you will see some pictures of synagogues in Vienna and in Austria. The only synagogue that survived is the, the center is the Stadt Temple, is the, in, in the center of the city, and that's the picture on the bottom. Um, there once were 28 synagogues, all of which were destroyed in the Night of Broken Glass on November uh, 9th, 1938. So this is, this is just something to keep in mind. When we get to these films that play in the post-war period, a lot of terrible things happened in Vienna. We don't even have to get to the war yet. A lot of terrible things happened there. Uh, Vienna was also known for its anti-Semitism. Uh, it's Mea Karl Lueger, 
uh, was a political anti-Semite. That was something that was possible in the 19th century. And at the turn of the 20th century, future leaders, including Hitler, went through Vienna and absorbed some of these ideas. So this is a very important thing to note. Now, of course, you notice have future Nazis going through Vienna. At various periods, Vienna is also a place where communists are. You have uh, Stalin, Lenin were in Vienna at various times. So it's a place for various different ideas that come up. Uh, but that's what makes the place fascinating and complicated um, at the same time. And uh, the Holocaust in Austria, uh, well, you had before the Holocaust 167,000 Jews, uh, two thirds of whom managed to survive. Uh, another third was murdered because they couldn't get out in time. So people who survived generally managed to get out before World War II started or in, in, in the following uh, months. And after World War II, there were roughly only 7,000 Jews left um, in Austria. And this is something that's not talked about in the third man, but it's there in the background. You have, and, and I'll talk about this when we get to the film. So it's, it's just there's a lot of terrible things happen there. And then after World War II, things become very, very calm. And we'll have to talk about that too. Sorry? The, the, there's uh, um, Judenplatz, the, 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 the medieval synagogue that was yes. discovered, yeah, Judenplatz. Yes, yes, that was recently turned into a, a, a memorial, yeah. And second, wasn't Luther more influential on Hitler and the rest than the people you said? That's, that's perhaps a little bit, a little bit off topic. Uh, so then after World War II, uh, just very quickly, uh, now, moving towards our first film, uh, Germany was divided by the four allied powers, and this is something that you might know already. Uh, it eventually led to the partition of Germany into East um, and West Germany. Uh, but what you may not realize, or you may realize, is that Austria was also um, divided into these allied zones, and I'm, I'm now working towards our first film, The Third Man. Um, you had basically in the east, what looks a little bit orange or red here, that was the Soviet zone, which then connected to Czechoslovakia and Hungary. In the south, you had the British zone. Then in, in the center, the American zone, which connected to the American zone in Germany. And in the west, you had the French zone, which connected into the French zone, also in Germany. What was different from Berlin, and this is a very, very important difference, is that the center of Vienna was actually administered by all four allied powers. So the situation is very different. You can't actually separate the allies into their own sectors. In the first district, in the center of Vienna, uh, when the military police came, you had to have four MPs come. They had to be a Soviet MP, an American, a British, and a French MP. They could never work on their own. So here's a problem in the Cold War. You can't actually ever conceive of having a wall or a separation. They have to work with each other. And when Austria becomes neutral in 1955, there's probably two reasons for it. The first one is Khrushchev being able to do that at that point, because there's a little bit of thawing going on in the Soviet Union. But frankly, the Americans also want out of the deal, because Vienna is the last place in that time period where the Americans have to talk to the Soviets every day. They have to communicate. And and perhaps that would have been a good thing, but that's something that was unique. And so unlike Berlin, there was really no separating this. But that comes after the film that we will talk about. Um, so here you see a picture from 1955. That was the last year that you had this military police uh, cooperation. Um, and yeah, let's talk about Austria after the war. So it was divided in four allied zones. Um, Austria was recreated without the Austrians realizing it. In 1943, the Allies met in Moscow and decided Austria would be a country again, uh, largely because it would make Germany smaller. Um, 
Very few Austrians, unless, unless you listened to the BBC or some foreign radio, you didn't know that was going to happen. Um, however, in 1945, at the end of the war, Austrians discovered that was actually pretty convenient because Germany could be blamed for everything and Austria could simply emerge as, as something very different. Um, so Austria was only occupied by the Allies for 10 years, became neutral then, uh, and, and did its own thing. And we'll talk about that when we get to the, the James Bond film that I'm gonna talk about. So, um, here we go, let's talk about The Third Man. The Third Man from 1949, this is before anybody can conceive of, 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 of um, the Allies leaving Vienna. In fact, um, this is set in a city that is dealing with uh, its post-war situation, so to speak. So it's a city in which there are black markets. Uh, in fact, actually, if uh, you couldn't really go to Vienna as a tourist in those days, as an American. Um, if you arrived at the American airfield, there were signs in English that said, beware of the natives. <laughs> and that was, yeah, because they, there was the suggestion that, that, that local Austrians might rob you because, they, you know, they, they'd want your stuff. So that's, um, and when I was in graduate school and I took a history class, I, I, the professor told us, World War I and World War II, if you look at the relationship between Austria and the United States, it's really, this is, these are two kind of unusual moments because already by the 1950s, Vienna rebounds and becomes a tourist center and, and, and fairly prosperous, actually. But so this is really a, a strange moment where this grand city uh, is um, in rubbles, except, 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 although you will see some destruction in this film, compared to other cities in Central Europe, Vienna wasn't even that terribly destroyed, okay? Uh, and then you might wonder, why is that? Well, if you look at a map, you see that Vienna's pretty far east, central Europe. So the, the Allies couldn't bomb Vienna out of England. But they could, but they couldn't really do it effectively. Uh, because you'd have to fly very long and then fly back. So most of the destruction in Germany is in the northwest. So Vienna started seeing some destruction from air raids in, in late 1943, primarily flights out of Italy after the Americans had landed in Italy. And uh, most of the war damage came actually from the fighting in 1945 when the Red Army uh, came in and there was fighting house from one house to um, the other. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the actors uh, in The Third Man. And what you will see here is a cast that appeals both to an English-speaking audience and a cast that appeals to German-speaking audience. Many of you will immediately recognize Orson Welles, uh, and you'll probably recognize um, Joseph Cotton from American film, right? Uh, and and that, that was the idea, right? You make a film with a great cast that, that English and American audiences immediately are drawn to. Uh, then you have, for the Austrians, Paul Herbiger was vastly more interesting. They, they didn't know who these, these Americans and Brits were. And then you have Alida Valli, who is an Italian actress uh, who's kind of new. Uh, Hedwig Bleibtreu, who also very, very popular with German-speaking audience. And then Ernst Deutsch, who is really fascinating, because Ernst Deutsch is an Austrian Jew who was in the United States. He came back to Austria, which wasn't very easy because Austria wasn't taking um, Jews back, but he came back and actually had a career as an actor. Uh, and he actually was the only um, Austrian actor in the film who could speak English very fluently. Why? Because he had been in the United States. So Paul Herbiger, for instance, uh, he still had to memorize his English lines. And then at one point, it got really funny because he said, you know, uh, hell and heaven, and then they kept that in the film. He was mixing it up, but <laughs> so, and this wouldn't happen today because uh, English is, um, you know, more common in Central Europe in the last many decades, actually. So this is a film noir. It's, it's, it's uh, part of this genre of, of, of black and white films after the war that are very dark and gloomy and there's crime. And the crime is all about, um, it's about the black market and a new drug that is very important, penicillin, right? It's the first antibiotic. 
and which really made a humongous difference because you could, you could cure things that, that beforehand you, know, you would just die from. But because it was rationed, there was a black market and there were people who were thinning penicillin. If you thin penicillin, it, it doesn't, it's not effective. And then people die despite thinking that they're getting the treatments. And so that's, that's one of the main plots here. Uh, Orson Welles, who plays Harry Lyme, he's the bad guy who's involved in this, this kind of ring. And then Joseph Cotton, who plays Holly Martins, is the naive American uh, fiction writer who shows up in Vienna because he doesn't know what else to do with himself after what. That's a little bit strange as a plot. Uh, and, and the British keep trying to get him out of there and say, you have to leave, you can't be here. So, so that's really the setting. What I want to show you is um, a part of the third man, actually a two and a half minute long clip that is set in Vienna's amusement park. Uh, to your left, you see a picture of the Riesenrad, the big Ferris wheel that London plagiarized about 20 years ago when they came up with the London Eye. It's the fake thing. The real thing is in Vienna. It's an Eiffel Tower that turns, right? So much as we have, you know, Paris has the Champs Elysees and the Eiffel Tower, and we do things in circles. But then you see here, that's what it looked like right at the end of World War II. By the time we get to the film, in, which was done in 1948, it's operational again, okay? And I'm gonna show you a scene where Harry Lyme is talking uh, to, um, where Austin Wells, who's playing Harry Lyme, is talking to um, Joseph Cotton, who's playing Holly Martins, and explaining a lot of things. And in the backdrop, you get to see Vienna. But what you're seeing is a city that is partially destroyed by the war. Uh, and it's a very, very witty scene. So I'm gonna go ahead and play this, um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this. So let's make sure the technology works. Uh, that's always the victims. Yes, it works. Be melodramatic. Look down there. Would you really feel any pity if one of those dots stopped moving forever? If I offered you 20,000 pounds for every dot, Doc, would you really, old man, tell me to keep my money? Or would you calculate how many dots you could afford to spin? Free of income tax, or Free of income tax? Oh, well, you can save money now, do you? A lot of good your money will do you in jail. That jail's in another zone. There's no proof against me. Besides you. I should be pretty easy to get rid of. Pretty easy. Wouldn't be too sure. I carry a gun. Don't think they'd look for a bullet wound after you hit that ground. You dug up your coffin. And found Harbin? What fools we are not talking to each other this way, as though I'd do anything to you, or you to me. You're just a little mixed up about things in general. Nobody thinks in terms of human beings. Governments don't. Why should we? They talk about the people and the proletariat. I talk about the suckers and the mugs. It's the same thing. They have their five-year plans. <laughs> so have I. You used to believe in God. Well, I still do believe in God, only. I believe in God and mercy and all that, but the dead are happier dead. They don't miss much here, poor devils. What do you believe in? Oh, if you ever get Anna out of this mess, be kind to her. You'll find she's worth it. I wish I'd asked you to bring me some of these tablets from home. Holly, I'd like to cut you in, old man. Nobody left in Vienna I can really trust, and we've always done everything together. When you make up your mind, send me a message. I'll meet you any place, any time. And when we do meet, old man, it's you I want to see, not the police. Remember that, won't you? <laughs> Don't be so gloomy. After all, it's not that awful. But what the fellow said, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and 
bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love. They had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did that produce? The cuckoo clock. So long, Holly. Um, so, let's see. Let's see. Get back um, out of here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so basically you see how um, uh, Orson Welles' character, oops, I don't know why I'm so loud suddenly, um, how his character makes fun of, of places that don't have uh, all these struggles. And, and that's what I said earlier, Vienna is both a, a beautiful place, but it's also a very troubled place in its history. Um, so then, um, what happens in Austrian film uh, over the next 30 years before we get to our next film, I wanted to talk to you about Myth Buildings. Uh, a film series that you may have seen, if you like Netflix, is the Sissy Film Trilogy. Um, it's not that popular in the United States, it's very popular in Europe. Uh, and this was very important in the 1950s, because when you're looking backwards, what you see is you see World War II, you see the Nazis, you see the Holocaust, it's, it's, and it's terrible. And then, so what they suddenly decide, oh, okay, let's make a film about the last empress. Empress Sissi, uh, who was uh, married to Kaiser Franz Josef from the 1850s until she was assassinated in 1898. Um, and so these were glamorous films about the empress and, and Sissi. And a large portion of tourism in Vienna today deals with trying to hark back to the monarchy. And to illustrate this a little bit further, first time I took students to Vienna, which is already 11 years ago, we were walking up to the palace and a student asked me, is this still a monarchy? And I was like, oh my God, what did I do wrong? <laughs> well, no, because Austria would make you believe that it still is a monarchy. It's still just a fairy tale place. Uh, and, and, you, and so it's, it's this kind of selective memory, right? Uh, because it is, these, these people really did exist, this monarchy existed, um, but it's kind of perceived stronger than other things, and, and for good reasons, because there's some, some pretty awful things you could be remembering. Um, so it's less popular in the English-speaking world, but it does exist, uh, and so that's something that Austrians really associate with their history and their film. They think about the Sissy films, they think about, um, about the emperor, and, and they're actually surprised when American tourists don't immediately pick up on Sissy, right? So if you go to the palace, you can get a Sissy ticket, and they don't see that that's kind of funny in English, but they, because they think, oh, look, you want to see our empress. So that's what Austrians and, Euro and Central Europeans see. This is what you see when you think of Austria. Now, it doesn't deal with Vienna, but I have to mention it because you must be thinking about it already. Uh, the Sound of Music is exactly the inverse to Austrians, uh, right? I mean, Americans love the film. Music is great. When I take students to Salzburg, there's always several people who want to start singing, and I let them, why not? They're happy. Um, when I came to the United States, people started saying Sound of Music, and I kept thinking, why do they keep saying Sound of Music? Which Sound of, what, what, what is the Sound? And then I realized it was a film, and I had to find that VHS, and then I was very disappointed, because it's two and a half hours, and it doesn't end. Uh, and, you know, Austrians don't like the film, except it's actually an amazing gift, right? Because it, it, it again, builds this myth of the bad Germans, the good Austrians, right? Uh, it, it does paint Austria in a very, very positive light. It, it certainly has brought a lot of tourists to Salzburg. Um, and I guess this is how you see the power of film, and you can essentially design whatever myth you like, right? We just talked about Sissi being the myth that Austrians and Central Europeans like, and then The Sound of Music uh, is another way of looking at Central Europe uh, and, 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 and seeing something that you want to see, okay? So, we were talking about The Third Man. That was during the Allied occupation. In 1955, Austria becomes neutral. And it's a very unusual situation. When you look at the center of Europe, there are essentially two neutral countries. There's Switzerland, but Switzerland has been neutral in the two world wars, so that's pretty established. Austria is neutral essentially because the Allies can't decide should it be on the west, should it be on the eastern side, so they decide we both withdraw. Uh, neutrality, when I was growing up, was uh, 
you know, not a very safe thing because if the East and the West had started a war, the Soviets would have been in Vienna within an hour. Um, there was no plan to defend Vienna. The Americans were poised on the German border. They were also ready to come back. Of course, it never came to that. Um, the benefits of neutrality, well, Austria could play both sides. So uh, there were contacts to East Germany, contacts to West Germany. And at the same time, it was also a little bit slower in developing um, economically. Why? Because it couldn't fully participate in Western uh, associations. It was not a part of the European community. It wasn't a part of NATO. And at the same time, of course, it didn't want to necessarily get too close to the Soviet sector, wasn't allowed to either. So, you know, it, it did its own thing. Um, one of the things that Austrians very quickly realized, one of the benefits of the Cold War, is that it was a great meeting place, right? So you could have uh, world leaders come. And, and most famously, JFK and Khrushchev met in Vienna in 1961 uh, during one of the summits. Um, and so that, that was, of course, a big deal. Um, but it's not just the big leaders who came. It was also a hub for espionage. And it actually still is to this day, actually. Uh, just different kind of espionage. Uh, and so in the 1970s, the Austrians thought, well, how can we capitalize on this? And so Austria built a headquarters for the United Nations. You know the United Nations are headquartered in New York and Geneva, and they have an office in Vienna as well, um, that Austria built for the United Nations. They charged them a rent of one shilling, which was about 10 cents a year. Uh, but it brought all these international organizations and people to the city, which was economically very beneficial. But it also, of course, brought other kind of uh, 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 meetings, you know, ones that were a little bit more covered up. So when we get to James Bond now, uh, Vienna is this neutral ground where Soviets and the Americans and, and lots of other people can meet and talk officially and um, unofficially. So let's see. Oh, and before we get to that, at the same time, Vienna is becoming a center for tourism, right? Uh, and tourism is one of Austria's big, big uh, economic uh, uh, you know, ways of making money. Uh, so while in the third man, you know, when Holly Martins comes in, as an American and he wants to get a job there and hang out, it's all very strange. By the time we get to the living daylights, and certainly with before sunrise, tourism plays a big, big role um, with um, Vienna. Okay? So um, the living daylights, 1987. Um, if you like James Bond films, you may not like this film because you may not like Timothy Dalton. Uh, every time I go on the internet, people are you know, debating who they like best as a James Bond, and Timothy Dalton always comes out as, as the least popular one. Uh, this is my favorite James Bond film. Why? Because it is in Vienna. And uh, it really combines uh, a sightseeing tour of the city as much as it, it, it is a regular James Bond film with all these, these um, kind of thrilling moments. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip where you get to see um, basically uh, how the city is depicted. What I'm not going to show you, but I want to share with you, is that um, the, the film plays in Vienna. It also plays in Bratislava, which is now the capital of Slovakia, but once was in communist Czechoslovakia. They couldn't film in Bratislava. So they filmed the Bratislava scenes in Vienna as well. So you have both the glamorous Vienna, and then they went to more average neighborhoods and made them look even more drab than they were, and then put a few communist stars up. And then they found the oldest trolley cars that were still running and beat them up even more and pretended it was the communist bloc. And that was really funny. Um, to me as a 13-year-old to watch that because I could tell this is not Bratislava. And like, wow, we really can look like the Soviet bloc too, if you want to. Um, so, but I won't get into that. Um, we're going to focus on the beautiful parts of Vienna uh, that you will see. You'll see the Riesenrad again, which plays a big, big role in this film as well. So we're going to go take a look at this clip. Um, oh, before I start with that, of course, I, I mentioned Timothy Dalton plays James Bond. And then, well, one film wonder, uh, Mariam Dabo is the female lead. Um, she's really just known for this film. Um, 
So, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance in one night. Vienna's beautiful, just like Georgi said. You care for him a great deal, don't you? I owe him everything. My scholarship at the Conservatoire, my strat. Your cellos are studied various. A famous one, the Lady Rose. Georgi got it in New York. Quite a present. Maybe someday I'll play there, at Carnegie Hall. <laughs> Georgi believes I can do it. I'm sure he's right. We go to him now? Yeah, unless he had to move on. If he did, I'm sure he left a message. Good afternoon, Mr. Bond. You will need your usual suite. Not tonight, Hans. Uh, something with a second bedroom. Yes, sir. Shall I have the vodka martini sent up? Shaken, not stirred. Of course. <laughs> My life, I've dreamed of this. Well, maybe you'll play here one day. It's too much to hope for. Mm. Excuse me for a few moments. You 
be able to see better. Ballon, mein Herr? Nein. Is it real or just a dream? What's wrong? Why do we stop? I arranged it. We could be here all night. Don't. It's impossible. Knowing you only two days and all I can think of is how we would be together. Don't think. Just let it happen. Want another ride? <laughs> okay. So we have uh, essentially a. Um, let's see. Let me back to that. Yeah. So you can see there is something in film studies that they call homage. When um, the guy with the balloon comes and says, "Oh, ballon, mein Herr," the exact same thing happens in the third man. So the film is definitely connecting viewers to the third man, which at that point is only about 40 years um, different, the film. Um, but the film's very different from the third man in the sense that, as I mentioned, Vienna is now a center of tourism. Uh, it's a little over the top because they, they drive up in a horse carriage at the royal palace, which is not a hotel, <laughs> and then they check in and it makes it seem like you could do that. But, uh, but it's also already, it has this romance that you will then see in Before Sunrise, where Vienna is then essentially really just a center of tourism and a romantic place. Um, so that's kind of how this film fits into um, the context of these three films. Um, the Riesenrad, of course, plays a, a, a very important role in, again, centering um, the film. Okay, so then we will continue to um, the final film that I wanted to talk about. That's before sunrise. And this is a film, when I saw this the first time, um, I said to myself, this is, this is really not about plot. It really is just about promoting a city. Um, you have essentially um, two uh, famous actors. You have Ethan Hawke, who many of you probably know, and Julie Delpy, who's a French actress but showed up in a lot of 1990s film. Um, it's, it's the film of two young people who essentially spend a day in Vienna. Uh, it has a sequel where they then go to Paris, so Vienna and Paris are suddenly on equal footings. Um, Vienna is no longer troubled by the Cold War. It's after the Cold War. It's not troubled by its post-war period. It simply is just a beautiful place uh, where people um, can spend time, and it's a romantic comedy, and uh, uh, I'm not sure why people like it. It was actually relatively popular. I liked it because it's Vienna, right? Uh, and if you like Vienna, then you'll like it too. Um, but other than that, it isn't as strong a film. I will show you a much shorter clip of this um, that also has a very funny moment um, in it. So um, and I think we're still doing fine for time. Um, okay. Now I'm gonna call my best friend in Paris, who I'm supposed to have lunch with in eight hours. Okay? Okay. Ring, ring, pick up. <laughs> pick up the phone. Uh, oh, hello. I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it for lunch today, I'm sorry. I met a guy on the train and, well, 
You convinced me. So listen, here's the deal. This is what we should do. You should get off the train with me here in Vienna and come check out the town. <laughs> what? I don't really have enough money for a hotel, so I was just going to walk around, and it'd be a lot more fun if you came with me. Why'd you get off the train? You trapped me. We just got into Vienna today, and we're looking for something fun to do. Sprechen Sie English? Yeah, of course. Yeah, I could you speak German for a change. He's kind of tall, and he's a little clumsy. What? He has beautiful blue eyes, nice pink lips, frizzy hair. <laughs> I love it. I like to feel his eyes on me when I look away. You couldn't possibly know why a night like this is so important to my life right now. But it is. I think he's crazy about you. Really? You gonna see him again? <laughs> We haven't talked about that yet. Tonight's it, huh? Tonight's our only night. So basically, you have a, a film that, that um, they, they spend the whole day going around Vienna. Um, the tour that they do is humanly impossible because you'd need three days to go all the places. Suddenly they're here, they're suddenly they're there. And like, how did they get there? And they only have so much time. Uh, um, but it, it's an amazing uh, uh, tour of Vienna, all the major sites. Of course, they end up on the Riesenrad, on the Ferris wheel, and in the Ringstrasse. And then the only funny part in the film is that scene on the bridge, right, where they say, do you speak English? And they get the sassy answer, do you speak German for a change, right? So, which is a subtle criticism of how touristy Vienna has gotten. But um, for the most part, that's, uh, it's a film that I use with my students before I take them to Vienna to get them excited about Vienna. Uh, and it's a cute film. It probably plot-wise is, is, is compared to James Bond and, and um, The Third Man. It's not nearly as uh, important um, a film.